Hi, I'm Anne from Game Like a Mother. I specialize in games that can be played in 20 minutes or less, and these are my top 10 games to gift to extended family. That means grandma, grandpa, in-laws, parents, aunts and uncles. Basically, if it's an adult over the age of about 40, uh, these are games that should work for them. They are both for people who play a lot of games or not a lot of games, and they have a very universal appeal. I have all the games listed in the description of the video along with the timestamp if you want to skip to a particular one, and I've included links to any of the how to play videos I've created for these games as well. Let's get started. First up, we have the game Push. It is a push your luck game in which you are trying to get the most points. All you do is on your turn, you play out cards on three different stacks. And if two of the same color or two of the same number would have to be played on the same stack, then you go bust. And this game is so great because it is for everyone. Literally everyone I've played this game with has loved this game. It works for young kids, it works for uh, grandparents, it works for everybody in between, and they have a blast playing it together. Part of what makes this game so fun is uh, it's a small little box, it's very portable, it's two to six players, which is a really nice player count, and people are uh, really engaged every turn because the three stacks that are out there, as long as you don't go bust, you get to collect one stack and get the points on it. But then there are cards that can change the direction of who gets to collect the other two stacks. The other stacks go to other people in the game. So they're putting out points for themselves, but you can get points too. And so you get those cards, but then there can be a card on it that makes you roll what we call the die of doom. And the die of doom uh, if it rolls a particular color, then you have to give away all of those. Those They get discarded, all of the colors, uh, the cards that go correspond with that color, and you can lose points. So it's just so easy to learn. It's so fun to play. The gameplay uh, is quick and easy. So this is just a standout, um, and it works for literally everyone. Next, we have Super Mega Lucky Box, which is essentially strategic bingo, and you're just trying to get the most points. Uh, I would give this to game to anyone who can handle like a ticket to ride level strategy game, then they can totally handle this game. And you don't realize until you play a game like this how satisfying it is to check off boxes, because that's what this game is. Uh, you have little uh, cards in front of you with um, a three by three grid with numbers between one to nine in them and number and cards are flipped over with the number on them and you get to pick one spot to mark off that number each turn. But then as you continue to go, uh, if, you if you fill out a whole uh, row or a column, you get a bonus for doing that. And it can be things like a lightning bolt, which allow you to change numbers if they're flipped out and so for you, if that eight comes out and you pay two lightning bolts for it, you could say, mm, no, I'd rather have it be a six instead, and then mark a six spot on your board. Um, you can get stars, which are worth some bonus points for um, the round that you're playing them on. You can get moons that matter at the end of the game, or you can get uh, numbers that allow you to mark off other numbers on other um, cards in front of you. And so you can have this thing going on, especially later in the game, where you mark off a bonus, and then that triggers another bonus, which triggers a couple other bonuses, and you're just going along saying, oh, whoa, I got this, I got this, hold on, I get to mark a bonus or two, and it's very fun and very satisfying. And I especially like this game because you are working independently with the cards that are flipped out on your own set of little like bingo style cards where you have spots to mark them off. And uh, there isn't anybody messing with what you're doing on your personal little board. So it's it's nice um, for that. And especially at the end of the game, you can have some really close scores. And so uh, someone can win by just a point or two. And so it feels like you've had a really good game. And because it is so quick and it is so fun, it's easy to say, oh, good job, you got that one. Let's play another one because it is just 20 minutes. Next, we have Draftosaurus, a game in which you are trying to place dinosaurs in a zoo and score the most points. Uh, and this game, again, is for everyone. Kids as young as five can do okay at this game with a little adult help. But 
we've played this with just groups of adults and had a great time. It doesn't feel like a kid game, even though the dinosaurs make it so kids often just really want to play. So it is, it is just so great. Um, the gameplay, it's called Draftosaurus because you're drafting. You start with six dinosaurs and on uh, your turn, you place one in the pen of your choice in the zoo, then everybody passes the dinosaurs to their left, and then you have a new set to choose from, and then you place one in a pen in the zoo and pass it on, and you just do that. You place six, get another six dinosaurs, place those ones. Once you've placed 12 dinosaurs, the game's over. So it is quick, it is simple, but it is so fun. Uh, the pens that you're placing them into have names like the Forest of Sameness, where they all have to be the same dinosaur, the Meadow of Differences, where they all are supposed to be different dinosaurs, uh, the uh, Prairie of Love, you need to have a set of two dinosaurs in there that's the same type to score, and then uh, Solitary Island, where just one dinosaur there. Um, so there's different scoring for the different pens, and it's fun because you have to be strategic in how you're uh, placing dinosaurs in your pens because you can get a little bit more uh, for placing them into the forest of sameness, but people are able to see pretty quickly, oh, you're collecting pink uh, brachiosauruses, so I'm going to make sure I place those before they get to you so that you're not able to place as many in that pen and score a bunch of points. So maybe it's better to go for the um, meadow of differences because you can just plunk kind of whatever dinosaur you want in there and it's a little bit easier even though you don't get as many points. So it's nice, you have some good strategic decisions to make, but really it's pretty forgiving and there's generally a spot where you can place them pretty well. Although they also have, for another little twist, they have a die you roll and then that can limit where people get to place their dinosaurs, except for the person who rolled the die. The rules don't apply to them. So this is one of those games that is just, I feel, quickly become a staple uh, gam family game because it works for such a range of ages. Everyone really enjoys it. You can be successful at the gameplay. It's a two-sided board, so if you just play a ton on one side, then you can switch and play on the winter side of the board too. So you can play this a ton, and it is an excellent game. Next we have Ticket to Ride London, but they also just came out with San Francisco, New York, and Amsterdam. So basically pick your favorite city and go from there. These are like condensed 20 minute versions of the regular Ticket to Ride games in which you're just trying, to, it's the same premise, you're trying to earn the most points by claiming routes and earning destination tickets. Uh, and this game, is so great for anyone who wants to feel like they're taking a trip, but from the comfort of their own house. And so all you're doing is you are uh, collecting uh, transportation cards that um, match a certain color for a route, and you're trying to do things like get from Buckingham Palace to uh, the Tower of London, but maybe you have to go through Hyde Park on the way, and you're hoping no one claims one of the routes you'd like because then you're going to have to take a longer way around, which is going to be inconvenient and maybe cost you some points. So the gameplay, it's so easy to learn, it's fun to play, this is just a family favorite. Next, we have Five Minute Mystery, which is a speedy and replayable whodunit. If you're looking for a cooperative speed game with a great theme, this is it. Uh, in this game, you're trying to solve a case and you are trying to figure out who the culprit is. You get to do that by looking at scene cards and finding symbols on them and entering into the codex. Uh, and then you're able to eliminate suspects until you come down to the correct culprit and hooray, you've done it. Um, I love this game because they have different levels of the cases you're trying to solve. There's rookie, veteran, detective, or master. So you can really match the level of whoever you're trying to play it with because if you're playing with just two people, there's kind of a lot to do. If you're playing with a bunch of people, then you can split up the jobs a bunch and maybe you're, you're sitting there and having kind of a leisurely chat while you're playing the game. So it's just a great themed game. It's a great whodunit and you can really match it well to whatever your group is going for when you play. Next we have Ohanami, a very zen game in which you are trying to create the highest scoring Japanese garden. All you're doing is you're going to take turns placing, you have cards that you get to place into three different columns in front of you. And the trick is you place two cards, 
per turn, and you have to play them either on um, the highest part of the stack that's in front of you or on the lowest part, and it matters. It has to be in numerical order. So if you have a 47 and then a 98 card above it in a row, you have to play something over 98 on it or below 47. Uh, so what's nice about this is you are scoring different colors of cards each round. And so you are trying strategically to take the cards that score the most points, but you have to be careful that by doing so, you aren't making really big gaps in your numbers, which are going to make it so you can't place cards at the end of the game, and then you don't score as many points and you ruin your zen. And so there's that for the game for you. Uh, this is one of those games that uh, is very easy to teach. The basics are very simple to play, but it's interesting and a little bit different each time how you're able to best put together the cards into the, the grid in front of you. And it's one of those ones where I could happily play this with my husband most evenings. It's really portable. He's taken it to work before. It's like a lunchtime game to play with a friend. It's one of those ones that I play in the evening for some ladies game nights. So it's just a really versatile game. It's very fun and easy to play, easy to teach. And if you have someone who could use a very nice, simple, but fun card game, this is an excellent pick. Next, we have Yam Slam, which is essentially updated Yahtzee. All you're trying to do is collect poker style chips uh, in order to earn the most points. You still get to do the thing where you roll dice three times and you get different things like large straights, small straights, uh, four of a kind. And in this, if you get a five of a kind, it's called a Yam Slam instead of a Yahtzee. And there are a couple things that set this apart and make me really uh, prefer it to Yahtzee. One is the scoring system. I love that there isn't a score sheet. You aren't having to cross anything off. Um, it's just you count up your chips at the end of the game, so it's really easy. If you keep on rolling, uh, it's it's communal chips out there. If, if As long as they're available, you can roll for it. So if you just are rolling large straights, you can keep on collecting those 50 point chips um, as long as they're available, which is really nice. And I also really love in this game, uh, in Yahtzee, I feel like most of the time it'd get about halfway through the game and I'd have to cross out my Yahtzee uh, score. I was never going to roll a Yahtzee. And then I would get it. Later on in the game, I'd roll a Yahtzee and it wouldn't count for anything because I'd already crossed it off. In, in Yam Slam, you are always rewarded for rolling five of the same number. Uh, it's called a Yam Slam. There isn't a chip for it on the board. You just get to collect whatever the highest value chip is that's left, and then you get a bonus turn. So it is always rewarding. It is always exciting and fun. Whenever you get a Yam Slam, you feel really good about yourself. Uh, so this And this was one of our games. This was our number one uh, pool side game this past summer. We brought it all the time. It was really easy to play. Uh, perfect by the pool. The di it doesn't matter if dice get a little bit dirty or the tiles, the poker chips, easy to wash off if you need to. And uh, kids loved this game. Adults loved this game. It was great for everyone. Next, we have No Thanks, which is your ideal ironic game choice for Thanksgiving. Uh, in this game, you're trying to get the least amount of points. And all you do is uh, you have a certain amount of tokens, you flip out a card in the middle of the table, and each person gets a turn either choosing to take the card, or they can say, no thanks, and put a token out on it, and then it's the next person's turn to decide whether they want to take it, or if they also want to say no thanks and keep on passing it around. So this especially happens when it's a higher value card, like if you have a 30 pointer out there and it's early in the game, people will say no thanks, no thanks, no thanks, and put on your tokens until there get to be enough tokens on there that someone says, oh, I guess I'm going to take it. This is going to be helpful because later on I can say no thanks to other things. And because in this game, the cards stack for scoring at the end. So if that person with a 30, the next time around, a, a, a few cards later, a 29 comes up, they're very, very happy because if they take that card, 
it's worth no points to them. It just stacks with the 30 and that's it's still only worth 30 points if you have a 30 and a 29. If you have a 30, a 29, a 28, and a 27, that's still only worth 30 points because all the other ones stack underneath it. So this can be fun because you can mess with people a little bit in this game. And if that 29 comes around, the person with the 30 card can just say, and send it around again and everyone's groaning and saying, oh, I don't want all those points. Just take the card. You know you want it. And you pass it around and then they get a few extra tokens. And they're like the, the king or queen of the tokens over there with their big pile of tokens. And then they don't have to worry about taking anything they don't want to for the rest of the game. This is also one where people will choose to mess with other people. Well, they'll say, ha, huh, I'm not going to let you have that 29. I'm just going to take it because then you don't get to do the thing you're trying to do. However, I also like that in this game, you can choose, if, if you're the person that's purposefully messing with people by taking cards they might want, you're taking points and you're probably going to end up losing. So that helps a lot where people say, oh, why are you doing that thing? Oh, well, oh, well, it means you're gonna lose. Uh, so it's it's a perfect family. It's, it's just lightly competitive. There's an opportunity to do things to each other a little bit, but none of it's mean-spirited uh, and, it, and it plays really well. So this has just been one of our favorites for a while now and it is a perfect family game. Next we have Otrio, which is essentially strategic tic-tac-toe. You're trying to get three in a row to win, but there's a few different ways to have three in a row in this game. Of your uh, little circles that you're using to mark spots, you can have three of the same size circles in a row, three of the big ones in a row, you'd win. If you have a large, then a medium, then the small one in a row, you win. Or if you have it all on the same spot, you have all of your different size pieces in the same spot, you win that way too. So this game is great if you have someone who's uh, who's very into chess or checkers and uh, you wanna give them something else to try. This is of that type of game. It's an abstract game like that, but it has, uh, you can play two player, but you can also play three and four player with this game, which is very great. Uh, this works really well with younger kids. This works well for adults. So it's very versatile and that's nice too. And so this is great if you just want a game with easy rules, but very interesting and strategic decisions to make, this is your game. And finally, we have the game Cover Your Assets. It is by Grandpa Beck, so let that be your guide for who this game is geared for. The goal of the game is to be the first to get one million dollars, or you just say whoever has the most after a certain number of rounds is the winner. Uh, all you're doing in the game is you have cards in your hand, and they have different pictures on them. They're like uh, jewels, cars, piggy banks, comic books, and they have different values to them. And when you have a pair, you get to place them down on a stack in front of you. And then if you place another pair on top of that, whatever's on the bottom has been covered, your assets have been covered, and those ones are safe. The ones on the top, if anyone has a card that matches that, they can try to steal it. Uh, so they can, if you have piggy banks on the top, they can try on their turn to play a piggy bank and try to steal those from you, but you're allowed to protect it. And so if you have a piggy bank, you can place it on top of theirs. And now if they don't have anything else left to play, you get to keep everything. You now have four piggy banks in a row. And uh, so it's very simple. There's also uh, wild cards. There's uh, silver and gold, and you can use those to either protect uh, the assets you have or try to steal other people's. So I just like, it's very easy, collect pairs, place them in front of you. The stealing is funny and very simple to play and to understand, but this is just a great choice if you need a simple but very fun card game option. So that's it for my top 10 games to gift to extended family. Save that family member who said that they liked cows when they were seven or eight years old and have been stuck with cow themed gifts ever since. A real thing that happened to my husband's sister. Um, so hopefully you found a few games you're excited to gift on this list and thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you next time from Game Like a Mother. Mm -hmm.